and gentlemen, this is a National Security Forum is a political and economic and geopolitical and international relations forum. I must encroach upon the environmental briefly, however, because it's key to understanding what's so important about the Arctic. First question, why should we care what happens in the Arctic? After all, isn't it just a lot of snow and ice and tundra and, oh, maybe in summertime some Sami or Inuit people with, uh, you know, some cool looking white reindeer? No, that is not what the Arctic region is all about. The most important thing to remember about the Arctic region is that it is the Earth's air conditioning system. I'm going to talk just very briefly about air, atmospheric currents, and about ocean currents. Now, this is an oversimplified graphic of air currents. There are tens of thousands of air currents at any given time. This is a simplified version, however, and it makes the point. The equator is where the most sun hits because it's the fattest part of the globe. Air currents get hot there. They are taken then all over the Earth up into the Arctic where the density is such that they fall below and become cooler. The Arctic is a great heat sink for the Earth. So is the Antarctic, but we're talking mostly to a northern hemispheric audience, so we'll stick with that for now. This is a heat sink. It definitely takes the warmth out of the air, cools it down, and brings it back down to the rest of the Earth. It's a constant motion. Everything on Earth changes regularly, as do the air currents. There's a, I have two words up there to remember. One of those was heat sink. Thank you. And the other is albedo. The albedo effect is... You're free. Oh, my God. Hello? <laughs> Hi, friends. Oh, this is so much nicer. Okay. The albedo effect is what happens when more of the sun's heat is reflected back out of the atmosphere than is taken in by the atmosphere. That happens because the Arctic is white and it's thick ice, white ice. If you doubt that the albedo effect, wear a pair of black trousers outside in the middle of summer and then put a white pair on and you will see the difference immediately. So that is what the Arctic does for us and it's the same thing with ocean currents. That red area you see there, let's see if this little pointer does anything, it's obviously right around the equatorial regions. And the ocean currents are always in motion as well. And they do the same thing. They are carried down to the Antarctic and up to the Arctic. And when that happens, they are cooled and they come back cooler. The Arctic is the Earth's air conditioning system. We desperately need it to remain somewhat like it is with Earth changing every day in every way. You can't keep things static no matter how much people think because we are an arrogant species. We can stop XYZ or we can start XYZ or we'll find a technology that does something. Earth is bigger than that. Earth is older than that. This is what's happening. Now, the problem is there is, because of technology, more recently, a huge economic impetus to change the nature of the Arctic region. Transportation. In the 1500s and 1600s, the whole idea was to find a shorter route from Europe to the Orient or the Indies, East Asia as it happens, Southeast Asia, etc. What's happened now is we have the technology. The Russians have nuclear-powered icebreakers that can cut through three meters over nine feet of solid pack ice. They can tear it to shreds. And that route is a lot shorter for the shippers and the exporters. Resources. There are estimates that 36% or more of the world's remaining fossil fuels are locked in the Arctic. 
So there is another economic impetus to destroy pieces of the Arctic. Agriculture, the idea, especially for a nation like Russia, that has huge amounts of land in the Arctic region that have been under permafrost, well, what if we could turn that into more valuable farmland? The reason I have the question mark up there is, my only question is, that stuff has been under permafrost since the last ice age. Uh, one other comment, environmentally or geologically, typically Earth is a lot colder than it is today. We typically go roughly 100,000 years of glaciation, roughly 10 or 12,000 years in an interglacial period. We're at the 11,500 year mark now. So if you, we've been under permafrost even during this warming period. What happens? if you do lose that permafrost. How many, I'm not talking about woolly mammoths springing out of the earth, but rather, what kind of viruses, what kind of bacteria, what kind of anti, what, what all is in there that we don't know anything about that might actually harm us? Still, those are the economic impetuses. impetuses. Now, at a now at a political and military impetus, you can control the Arctic, you control the ultimate high ground. The Russians are doing just that militarily now. Now, I am not proposing a military solution, but I want you to know, and we'll show you, the, the, what the Russians are doing now is making sure that they own the Arctic lake. That's what they consider it, their lake. Just like the Chinese consider everything, well, we know where theirs is, the Nine Dash Line, this week. But I'm sure they'll, they'll extend the, the limits of their lake at there some point. What happens in the Arctic can change the balance of power in the world. So why should we care about what happens in the Arctic? Because this isn't all the Arctic is, although I would hate to lose this. There are many, many other reasons to keep the Arctic. What do we mean when we say the Arctic? Oh, come back here. We certainly don't mean the Arctic Ocean. I'm going to try using this, 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 this pointer, but basically some of you have probably been on cruises, maybe in Norway, raise your hand, you've been above the Arctic Circle, yeah. So you know this is a fixed point, it is 66 degrees 34 minutes north. There are other ways of thinking about it, like where trees grow and where they don't, or where the temperature never rises above 50 degrees, forget all that stuff. It's too squishy. It changes every year. Stick with what the definition is, and that definition includes all kinds of land mass, and all kinds of land mass that is not under permafrost. So when we talk about the Arctic region, we are talking about basically six nations whose economic zone, whose exclusive economic zone gives them a right to negotiate up in that area. But there's two more who, without the littoral access, but they're still in the Arctic region. The six are, of course, Russia, the United States because of Alaska, Canada, Denmark because it has, owns Greenland currently. Iceland is not actually physically within the realm of the Arctic Circle but its economic zone is, and of course Norway. Then it leaves two others, Sweden and Finland, and they have no access to the Arctic Ocean, but they're in the Arctic region. These are the members of the Arctic Council. It is their responsibility to negotiate in good faith what happens in the Arctic. And they're the ones that report to the UN, etc. However, Russia is currently hastening ice-free territorial waters. Now the distinction, of course, is territorial waters go out 12 miles. Economic zone goes out an additional 200 miles. Those 12 miles, we really can't tell the Russians what to do. But we can sure as hell if it goes 12 miles and one inch as a world, or as a nation, or as an Arctic Council, find ways to make sure that it goes no further. And that is absolutely critical that we do so. As I mentioned here, yeah, that's the shortest route. And again, the pointer doesn't do us justice here. But if you look at Russia, 
you will note they have the hugest land area and a massive amount of their industry is already up here warming up the Arctic region. This route, if you are going from Pickett, Bremerhaven, over to, uh, over to uh, Yokohama, this route, there's Japan, is much faster than going all the way down through the Mediterranean, through the Suez, around to the Straits of Malacca, and back up. It's a wonderful route economically, but what harm are we doing to the environment and how are we changing the balance of power at the same time? As I most mentioned here, the planet might be harmed, but hey, that's not Putin's problem right now. His problem is staying in power and bringing Russia back to what he believes is Russia's rightful place as the most important nation in the world. It's their business within those 12 miles until it isn't. And that's why you say all nations led by the Arctic Council have a stake in this. That includes the United States. There was a time when the United States took its leadership role seriously. You'll per permit me my aside here that I think about the 1992 was probably the last time that happened. We had looked the Soviets in the eye. They blinked. Saddam Hussein had decided he was going to take over the oil fields of Kuwait. He didn't. We weren't, didn't want to respond militarily. We did in that one case when we had to, but basically it was leadership and resolve. How do you stop a bully? You stand up to them. If you don't stand up to bullies, they just keep bullying. So. We need to take any action that goes beyond their territorial water. Russia, Russia stakes its claim in a couple of ways. They say, well, we have the most populous. Therefore, we should have 90% of the say of what happens here. Except I'd like to point out one thing about their populace that's not on the chart. First of all, I wonder how much of that populace is there because they were in gulags there until the end of communism. <laughs> and they just can't afford to go anywhere else or they haven't gone anywhere else because that became home. Second, you'll notice all of these nations here have, slightly, have either the same or slightly increasing population except Russia. It's actually losing population in the Arctic. So they will have to force people to go there or provide some other incentive to do so. Russia's nine dash line, that oblique reference there is just recently, last week, Vladimir Putin said, we, th this is an international body of water. We don't want to have foreign warships traversing it. So we will stop any foreign warship that decides to come through. The fact that Murmansk is still the largest port for the Russian military doesn't seem to enter into that sort of equation in their minds. And of course, it does quite well enter into it in their minds. So I think Putin looked at Xi Jinping and said, well, they're getting away with it. You know, they're, 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 they've got their own private little lake. We'll try to push the same thing. Again, I am not suggesting a military response to equal the Russians' military. I am telling you that we need the resolve. We need leadership. We need to make sure they understand, hey, you do not have the right to restrict navigation one inch beyond your 12 mile limit. So who's gonna win if Russia gets this? Well, they're already doing it. They've already brought many military vessels through and they just brought their first commercial vessel, commercial vessel through and that was a Maersk line and that was done in September. So this shortened route is pretty fascinating and pretty wonderful for some people. I mean, instead of going 13,000 miles, you go 8,000 miles through a de-iced Arctic, 10 to 15 days saving at, at sea per vehicle, vessel, that's a whole lot. That makes it less time in dry dock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Russia will be the toll taker for transit, but they'll also be a point for themselves to export stuff to the rest of the world that is currently economically infeasible for them to do. 
So they will get more of their own gas and oil and metals and timber and everything else easily to become a much bigger exporter. China will win because China deploys their profits from U.S. and other consumers into financing the Russian infrastructure. Heaven knows the Russians don't have any money to do it, so the Chinese do. Shipping firms, obviously, and the major exporters. So here's an example. If all goes smoothly for Russia, Russia sells more oil and gas and timber and diamonds and everything else to the rest of the world. Currently, 30% of their GDP always comes, already comes from the Arctic region. They'd like it to be even more. It's a nation that is a truly Arctic nation. That's where many of their resources are. One of their regulations, one of their rules already is that if you're going to go that route, you will have a Russian icebreaker taking you through there. There will be no such thing as any other nation being allowed to do that. You, it's always going to be Russians piloting through at some charge. Only Russian ships can carry any fuels in and out. Why? Because Russia is the world's gas station. Russia's economy depends on selling oil and gas. And they got a lot more of it up in the Arctic. So they're not dumb. Only their ships are going to be able to carry any fuels. And for now, the only ice-free route is through these Russian territorial waters, and personally, I'd like to keep it that way. Now, what are the stumbling blocks for the Russians? Well, you need all-weather infrastructure, and you need humans. You need people to live there, which means you have to create some kind of a civil society. You have to have some way of people to enjoy themselves there. You've got to be able to move people in there. All the Arctic nations get this. This is in Greenland. And most people who have flown over Greenland on their way over the pole to get to Europe or something, you look down and all you see is ice. But in fact, in summertime, plenty of people do live there and do enjoy living there. But, and Russia is rapidly expanding these massive investment projects, often underwritten by China, but here's your problem to me. That's Murmansk. That doesn't look like New Greenland. Greenland's much further, that's much further south. This is what they're going to deal with to be able to do this. What could go wrong when you string electricity lines everywhere, powered by coal or oil, warming up everything around it? it, it what could go wrong? Obviously, a whole lot. Who are the losers? Panama, really, it's no change. The Panama Canal, for shippers going in that direction, not a problem. Egypt, one of the world's poorest nations, is on its way to becoming poorer if the Russians succeed. They get a lot of their income from transit through the Suez Canal. Singapore, Malaysia, Southeast Asian economies, etc. a lot of trans shippers, uh, repair facilities, everything like that. Here's the other concern we should have. There's one other way to do this, one other way to shorten the route, and that's through Canada's Northwest Passage. Canada has acted very responsibly in this area and said, you know, to save a couple of bucks, it's not worth tearing up the Arctic. However, if Russia gets to the point where it is the only game in town, what pressure will be brought to bear on Canada from its allies and from others who are only thinking short term about the economic benefits to open up the Northwest Passage as well? Obviously, there will be huge damage, not likely damage, to the Arctic ecosystem and wildlife. And folks, that should be to us understanding what the, earth, what, what the poles do for the Earth, our air conditioning system for the whole rest of the planet, that should be of utmost importance. This is a gamble that Russia is taking. They are actually, this is a nation that lives by extractive industries. Get the coal out of the ground, get the gas out of the ground, get the diamonds out of the ground, get the aluminum out of the ground. They're already about a, a nearly 100% mining and drilling. And yet all the projects they're planning, everything you see in blue up there or red is mining or, or more oil and gas. 
So they're not doing their economy any favors. There's, there's virtually, there's very little service economy in Russia already. And what they're doing is putting themselves in a position where they're even more dependent upon those extractive industries. A good example where I have the arrow is the $27 billion LNG facility they have built with the help of the Chinese and the Chinese get a 30% stake. And if you've followed the OBOR, the One Belt Run Road Initiative, and seen what has happened to Sri Lanka, to Pakistan, to Malaysia, the One Belt One Road is peace and love, baby. We're going to try to make everybody happy, and this is going to be better for everybody, unless you don't pay us on time. In which case, reading the fine print, we get the bridge here, we get the port there, that's why they have a port in Djibouti right now, as a matter of fact. So we've got to be very, very careful about taking that kind of money for that kind of risk. And yet the Russians are doing just that. And remember, don't forget the issue that the Russians are constantly breaking up the ice. The sea is dark. It absorbs heat from the sun. Also, the sludge that comes out of diesel vessels and if they should open their, if they should want to clean inside when nobody's looking, all this stuff, all it does is make it warmer for the rest of us. So who's most serious about controlling the Arctic? I give you one graphic. The Russians have more icebreakers than every other nation you see on that chart combined. And they're building more at a faster rate than anyone else. So who's most serious about owning it all? Ah, oh, that might be our friends, the Chinese. A country with deep pockets and big ambitions. So the Chinese came out with their own Arctic white paper in 2017 to let the world know where they stood on the issue. Well, the first thing it says in the white paper is, China is a near Arctic state. Okay, folks, you see what I've done up there. Here's the Arctic. Here's the near-Arctic state. Now, I'm not even talking about all the ocean they have to traverse to get to the Arctic Ocean. I mean, as the crow flies, if that is the near-Arctic state, so is Ukraine. If that is the near-Arctic state, so is Mexico. So, by the way, this is a, a Chinese military map. And of course, like most nations, you put yourself at the center of the world. But, so if you're not used to looking at the world that way, that's the way the Chinese look at the world. And they call it the Polar Silk Road. That's right. And with a straight face, they say about the Arctic, all nations should have complete access to these international waters. I say with a straight face because how come the South China Sea gets to be 100% theirs, but the Arctic has to be open to everybody? It gets a little sillier yet. The dragons are circling. Uh, Xinhua, the Chinese national paper, says the LNG project developed jointly by China and Russia. China gave them money. But I guess that's part of joint development, if you want to think of it that way. And also quoting Xinhua, this passage through the Arctic Silk Circle is called the Silk Road on Ice. How many of you call it the Silk Road on Ice? How many of you have ever heard it called the Silk Road on Ice? Even the Russians don't call it the Silk Road on Ice. But never one to miss a PR opportunity. The Chinese are right there. And again, the hypocrisy. Admiral Zhu, who uh, has the responsibility for that part of the world's oceans in China, the Arctic belongs to all people around the world. No nation has sovereignty over it. China must play an indispensable role because we have a fifth of the world's population. That's not exactly a reason why you should be part of controlling the Arctic, but that's what they believe. And what they're doing about it is a charm initiative, as they often have done. And that charm initiative consists of loans, joint infrastructure, investments. They now have the largest embassy in Reykjavik Island, Iceland, because they believe that that will be the new transshipment point when all this is completed. They have 
uh, stirred up trouble in Greenland, saying, you know, what, the, what, what has Denmark done for you people? And continue to do that kind of thing. So they're, they're, they're players, just in a different way than we'd like to see them play. What is the United States Arctic policy? Yeah. It pains me to report this to you. But basically, yeah, they, what, what, what? Who cares about the Arctic? The Russian military buildup, however, is real. And I'm not saying we should react just because they have some wonderfully capable Spetsnaz folks up there and they're developing new technologies up there and so on. Uh, this quote comes from the Deputy Prime Minister of Russia. The, the 1867 sale of Alaska was, and I quote, a betrayal of Russian power status and has said the Kremlin has a right to reclaim our lost colonies. Now I know there are people who could say, hey, if you want Northern California back, you can have it. <laughs> I am not suggesting that. Merely pointing out this is the kind of paranoid thing that Russian serious leaders seem to actually believe. Nature abhors a vacuum is the point. You cannot simply let it go and let it happen. Putin has overseen a massive Russian buildup, but fortunately, every other nation that has a right to participate in the Arctic, by the members of the Arctic Council, by coincidence, are all NATO members. Norway is a good example. The U.S. is behind the curve, frankly. And we've done a little more training, sent a couple more Air Force fighters up to Alaska. We've planned a U.S. Coast Guard upgrade. Again, this is deterrent, folks. It's not offensive. But for heaven's sakes, let's not just forget that the Arctic exists. Here's Norway's response. By the way, uh, these are not Norwegians. This is our posse here. This is, uh, these are special forces folks. They're working with the Norwegians right now. They have invited more troops to the U.S. for joint field exercises. Same with air battle training. Same for adding ships to its fleet. To this, the Russian embassy said, we view it as unfriendly. Oh, darn. It will not remain without consequences. The Norwegian response was, let's get 700 more U.S. Marines there. <laughs> On so many fronts, this is a cold war, both literal and figurative. I believe we are in a new cold war, and I'd like to keep it cold rather than hot, and the Arctic is just one part of it. When I say, will the world sell China the rope, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the saying attributed to Lenin, even though he never said it, when it comes time for us to hang them, the capitalists will line up to sell us the rope. And I'm not going into China right now. It's a separate topic that I do discuss. But folks, just because we can buy cheap trinkets from China does not mean we should. China has been given a free pass by the United States sponsorship into the World Trade Organization, and they are taking advantage of it and stop selling them the rope. Finally, or soon finally, the free world won the last Cold War, not with bullets, but with strong leadership, united resolve, steadily standing in the face of bullies saying, that's enough, that's far enough. We have the capability to stop you. And they're not stupid. They'll understand that. This Cold War can be won the same way. I leave you with this. It isn't only about us, and by us, I don't mean just the United States and its allies, the Arctic Council, all of our adversaries. I mean, it ain't just about our species. One of these days, before I die, I want to be close enough to this guy to take that picture. That's important as well. So with that, for me and the rest of the boys and girls, I say thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. That was a fascinating presentation. I know we got you to go through this in about half the usual time. Um, so. I'm going to just pull this back so everybody over here can see. Lovely as... idea. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that. Great.
now you can see us. So I have a few questions. We can certainly take more. So if you have questions, please let us know. So I'm going to touch on a few comments that you did. And I've got these a little bit organized. First of all, um, in terms of legal standing, you mentioned the Arctic Council. Okay. Um, how does our status in the Arctic, how is it affected by the UN Convention on Law of the Sea and our status in or not in that? Convention of the Law of the Sea clearly states that a nation has the right to do whatever it wants within its territorial waters, no question. UN CLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, also provided the economic zones. We hadn't had those before 1982. We do now, and we really have, we the world has standing only for that area that goes an inch beyond the 12 miles. But at that point, we do, there are mechanisms in place for action by the rest of the world. There's individual sanctions that can be placed in addition and so on. There are fines available, etc. So there, it, there is, whether, whether a nation is a signatory to it or not, uh, there were enough nations that signed it that that's it. Excellent, thank you. Um, so let's go back in time a, a bit. Um, you started out with, I think, a, an excellent description of how the Arctic serves as our, the Earth's air conditioner. So let's go back um, in time a little bit in the paleo records and look at times when the Arctic was warmer and Vikings were settling Greenland and Iceland. Um, that period then um, was uh, obviously a time of trade um, and then followed by a mini ice age that happened. So are there any lessons recognizing we're in a totally different geopolitical standing than we are now, but are there any lessons for us as a nation um, looking at uh, being in the Arctic from, those, from the paleo records? Yeah, we have absolutely no power over what happens on the earth. Folks, I'm serious. If you, I, I happen to be reading a book right now that I cannot recommend highly enough to you, but it's by a geologist named E. Kirsten Peters. She's brilliant. It's uh, six years old is all. It's called The Whole Story of Climate. That's my library version. And you will learn so much in there that I cannot possibly condense. But basically, this is a much colder planet than humans know about. Our way back ancestors, hunter-gatherers, did know about it. The only reason that we have what we have today is because we are in a warming period. Within each massive warming period, there are many little ice ages and other warming periods. The point, the point is that the at times that uh, Maureen just discussed which just happened to be one of those warming periods. It didn't last that long. There was a Roman warming period, a medieval dark ages, a warming period, another ice age, and we happen to be in these little mini ones. The point is, the earth changes daily. You know, the, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. If you don't like the climate, wait 5,000 years, or 500, or 10. We don't know. We are so arrogant that we believe our technology and our knowledge of this particular species <laughs> transcends everything. It does not. The Earth could go based upon nothing more than volcanic inter uh, eruptions in a very different cold direction. Yes, I think it does help. It reminds us all that um, we are living on a dynamic Earth. And uh, don't think just because it's snowing today that it will be snowing, say, in July. Um, uh, so I do think that puts it in context. And obviously, um, for the, and I, I do agree, that book, wave, wave book around, um, really does help, help um, for people who want a very quick synopsis of what climate has been on Earth, um, particularly in human populations, that's an excellent reference. Okay, so now let's go back to geopolitics, okay? Uh, we're gonna start with one of my favorite questions, which is, and 
you did you did allude to it in your slide on the U.S. Arctic policy, so uh, which was kind of blank, but I had a nice picture. Um, what about the Coast Guard? What is our Coast Guard doing? And what is the status of us being able to have icebreakers and operations in the Arctic? We have three that work. Well, that's more than I thought. They have, thir they have 46 that work, and theirs are uh, all the ones that they have uh, under construction currently are nuclear powered, which means they have the power to rip up as much as they want, as much as geopolitically we will allow them to rip up, which I say stops at their territorial limit. And if they find there's a shorter route, forget it. So to go back to the question of what are, what are we doing? Well, we're planning on more Coast Guard vessels. The Norwegians are in probably the most difficult shape. They have 13 Coast Guard vessels in, in their entire fleet. Norway has to patrol a massive area between Jan Mayer Island and Svalbard and the rest of the northern Norwegian coast. And that's where the Russian fleets all come through out of Murmansk. So they need to build up, we need to build up, etc. And this is economic as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the icebreaker situation in the Coast Guard getting better, getting worse? Getting older. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> okay, so let's drill down on, I think, what was one of your major points on this presentation. You mentioned numerous times um, the need for U.S. leadership, U.S. resolve. Um, what specifically does that mean? And what do you think, if you could fast forward five years, ten years, what would our leadership be that will have affected positive change? And, and how would we measure the success of our leadership? The Russians have a northern command, and that northern command has been built up hugely. It would not be out of the realm of good military thinking to show the Russians in this case that the United States has built up its force and its eyes upon what happens in the Arctic. Right now, if you go to virtually any think tank, if you go to the Pentagon and say, what are our contingency plans in the Arctic? Well, that's where all of our, and the Canadian, I worked on the NORAD treaty once upon a time. That's where our missiles and the defense system are. No, no. They're not going to launch a thermonuclear war that they can't win. They're going to push. They're going to probe. They're going to pinprick. They're going to push us and find out what they can get away with. Our, our, our do line, to use the old term, is not going to do a damn thing about that. So what we need to do when I say resolve, is not say anything, speak softly, put a big stick in place, and say, go ahead, push. You're going to get pushed back. It wouldn't help to have those troops well, well trained to deal with Arctic situations. You do not simply send people in to that area. I have the honor of having attended the Cool School, which is uh, an Arctic survival course. I guarantee you need serious training. And once they see that we are doing that training and we are working with our allies and we're taking the leadership as the Norwegians already have, they'll back off. Let's, I, I hear you, but let's pull the thread on that. What really would incentivize Russia to not follow the path they're currently on, which is basically to throw a lot of resources and everything they got in developing the, the Arctic. What incentives are there out there to have them not follow that path? Because they're pretty much hell-bent on that pathway right now. And is there an opportunity for either bilateral discussions with the United States or multilateral engagement that would incentivize them to go a different route rather than punishing them for doing what they're doing now? Yes. Yeah, it got to be more than that. 
this should be a multilateral thing, obviously. And the, the fact that the other nations who have the right to negotiate on the Arctic Council, anyone with littoral uh, access, they're all NATO members. That's a very fortunate thing from a geopolitical standpoint. So let me answer it geologically first. We could have Krakatoa erupt and the Russians would not be able to use their icebreakers for another 30 years. That's probably not going to happen. But we don't know. It's just that kind of thing that we know the last time we were thrust into the Little Ice Age, it was a massive volcanic eruption. Simple as that. Geopolitically, however, which is where your question is, is, is based, yeah, multilaterally, we show strength. We show you cannot go beyond this point. You're getting away with something. Aren't you clever? And you're helping your country's economy. Isn't that great? Don't push it. And that's a multilateral response, and it has to come in this case, since this is the people in the Northern Hemisphere who are involved from the Arctic Council slash NATO. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you on the Krakatoa question here. First of all, Krakatoa has been quite active lately, so we may still have see it yet. Are you saying that changes in the Arctic and changes in the Earth's climate have nothing to do with anthropogenic emissions, or are you um, not? What What's your position on that? Are we talking about um, man-made induce change warming in the in the Arctic? Or is this just natural processes, in your mind? It comes from William Rodeman, who was retired at the time. He's 85 years old, brilliant, brilliant scientist, who said, we should be in an ice age by now, a glacier, they wouldn't call it that, in a glaciation period, of, in, in the beginning of. And what, he, what Dr. Rodeman came up with is, it's agriculture. When humans figured out agriculture, they started slashing and burning all the trees. They created these massive areas that once absorbed a lot of the sun's heat that now absorb even more. They started domesticating sheep and goats and pigs and cows. So yes, obviously there's anthropogenic inputs into this. Agriculture was the first. Industry is the next, and because of our technology, we're going to keep pushing that. So I have no doubt in my mind that anthropogenic is one input. I just think it's a pretty minor input compared to what my understanding of what the world can do all by itself with this species not even here. Some of us may take you on. Luckily... Uh, there are some, uh, I do have a geophysicist colleague in the audience, and we may discuss the uh, contributions to burning of fossil fuels afterwards. Um, but let's go back to the political issues. Okay, I thought it was fascinating that you talked about China's perspective of the polar belt and, and road initiative. Okay, so no, I hadn't heard that before. Um, you also talked explicitly about China's financing Russia's infrastructure. Can you give us some more insight? How does this work? I mean, they're not exactly the best of buds. What are they doing? How is it working? And what is the cost and return on investment for them? And what does Russia stand to gain or lose out of this relationship? Thank you. Politics makes strange bedfellows. I mean, Russia and China were great, great buds until they weren't. Look at our most recent history where they had border wars between the then Soviet Union and China. When it fits both of their strategic interests, they are going to be allied in one way or another. Even though neither trusts the other, culturally they don't like each other, but if China is making lots and lots and lots of money because we're buying their trinkets, for whatever reason China is making lots and lots and lots of money, and if the price of oil goes down by 10 US dollars, Russia is going back into the red. They are desperate because they are the world's gas station. 
they, their economy is based solely on extraction. So the Chinese are financing them. And I, I, I can't go it, 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 I can't say it any more clearly. If the World Bank is not going to finance Russia, the United States is not going to finance Russia in these dreadful endeavors, Russia needs to do it in, in, in Putin's mind. So you're going to find somebody that'll give you the money. Who's got money that doesn't care how dirty the money is or how it's being used? That would be China right now. So that's the reason for that strange partnership. Now, will that last forever? Heavens no. It'll probably last until the first time Russia doesn't make a payment and China says, uh, we want 45% of the uh, LNG plant at Yamal now. Because you're missing your payment. And if you read the contract here, it clearly says, we get to go up 5% every time you miss a payment. Excellent. Um, let's let's keep going on the China thread. Um, as you know, and we've had discussions about this, the engagement in the U.S. of the U.S. in the South China Sea um, with the freedom of navigation operations by the Navy um, is that. Are, are the activities that we have that are going on elsewhere in the world, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, impacting their posture in the Arctic, and is it positive or negative or not substantial? Thank you, Maureen. Um, at this point, they are using the Russians basically as proxies, sort of the way that the U.S. and Russia did with smaller nations around the world during the Cold War. So we didn't have to confront each other directly. We confronted each other elsewhere using those nations and proxies there. I think China is using Russia as a proxy. But there's certainly no doubt that they are very confident they have gotten away with a hell of a lot in the South China Sea. So they don't, it's not that there's any Chinese vessels currently that I know of, certainly no military vessels anywhere in the Arctic. They do have freedom of navigation. And if they ever dare set foot in the Arctic, the rest of the world, led by the United States, should certainly say, uh, how come it's okay for you to go within 30 miles of Svalbard, clearly a Norwegian island, but it's not okay for other people to go within 30 miles of Scarborough Shoal, a Philippine national reef that you have decided to take over. So the Chinese are putting themselves in an untenable situation. Now that doesn't mean they're going to be logical in the sense that uh, we might think of logic. I mean, you've seen some of those quotes I put up there. The whole world should be able to go through the Arctic, but nobody should go through the China Sea. The point is when, if they ever do put a military or possibly even commercial vessel, say that gives us their precedent and say, well then, you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. You've given us a tremendous amount of geopolitical insight, um, military insight, and, and really a, a wonderful perspective on, on that in the Arctic. But now I'd like to just turn in closing and ask you um, on a personal question. So how many people have traveled? You, you did this. How many people have traveled in the Arctic region? Okay, so a few, not a lot. So for the rest of the audience, or even for those who do, um, how do you, in your mind, what's the best way to see and understand what is happening there? What is the best way to follow this news? Because obviously it doesn't make it to the mainstream news every day, except today when it's snowing in incline. Um, how do we stay on top of this issue that doesn't necessarily make it to the forefront of our brains, um, but is incredibly important and may shape um, uh, the geopolitical situation and the environmental situation on the planet for decades to come. How would you advise people to understand and to stay apprised of this issue personally? Well, I don't recommend you join special forces and parachute into Norway like I did. This is not a fun way to learn about the Arctic region. <laughs> she said personally, so. <laughs> 
uh, those who have been there know the stunning beauty of it, and I would I do recommend that. Uh, my wife and I will be going back this summer, as a matter of fact, and uh, going all the way to the northernmost city in the world, Hammerfest, looking across at Russia in Murmansk. So that there's a personal thing there. You, you get to know what is really at stake and get to see the gorgeous wonderfulness of this air conditioner that we have up there. To stay on top of it, truly, uh, much as I hate to use the word Google, the, if you put Arctic if you put Arctic region on any search browser, or if you put politics of Arctic region, or if you put Russia in the Arctic, or China in the Arctic, all of those things will come up with an absolute plethora of articles. They just, you know, in journalism school you, you learn, if it bleeds, it leads. Anybody ever hear that? In other words, yeah, in other words, it has to be something just terrible and catastrophic, which is why the next storm is always the storm of the century. And, you know, it's two raindrops, but it's the storm of the century. Everything has got to be blown out of proportion to make it onto the front page. Nothing in the Arctic is going to make it on the front page. But if you look up those things, you will find lots of academic and think tank and military and State Department articles on this very topic and you will be stunned at how it she is not but should be closer to the front page. Excellent, Joe. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation.